you made it into the cross or to a crown or to a hat or, yeah, we weren't that disciplined. We didn't do that this year. Not like we're lacking in palm fronds in the backyard. We should do that next year. Note to sell. Kids, when you play today for your afternoon play day, grab yourself a palm frond so that you can be reminded of Christ Jesus paid for you. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. King of Israel, welcome to our hearts. Here to reign in righteousness. Oh, ruler of the world, ruler of our hearts. Now ascend your throne. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. To Jerusalem, to the sons of men, riding on in gentle strength. Oh, come to save your own, come to give your life. Your kingdom is at hand. You are the king of Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. King of Israel, welcome to our hearts. Here to reign in righteousness for oh, ruler of the world, ruler of our hearts. Now ascend your throne. You are the Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Sing that again. Oh, Hosanna, Hosanna. Three more. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Amen and Hosanna. Would you be seated? Okay. We need some really great ideas for Easter this year. Go! Me first. We do an Easter egg hunt, but to make it more challenging, we use trip wires. <gasps> trip wires. Hey, what about this? Dollar bills in every Easter egg. Hello! Mm, how about this? $10 bills in every Easter egg, huh? What's my name? Alexander Hamilton! <laughs> hey, we're not gonna give away our shot. Shot. Speaking of shot, I know a guy who knows a guy whose neighbor owns a cannon. We shoot the Easter Bunny out of the cannon into a giant inflatable Easter basket. Okay, pastor preaches his entire sermon while suspended in mid-air. We pay the movie trailer guy to read the liturgies. We rent a dunk tank that doubles as a baptismal. Lay AstroTurf over our entire parking lot. Everybody loves AstroTurf. Wire ropes that glow in the dark. Confetti cannons instead of amens. A laser show totally in pastels. Hey, y'all have any trash? No trash. Just a treasure trove of great ideas. This is gonna be the biggest Easter yet. Huh. What's bigger than Jesus raised from the dead? I am so sorry. We've wasted your time. And I thought gnomes were the grumpy ones. Good morning. Hosanna. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yes, that's the re that's the retort. I say Hosanna, you say blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Very good, very good. 
You know, Hosanna is 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 a old Hebrew word, as they say in seminary, and that means it's not just Hosanna. It is a cry. It is a, a desire to be rescued. It is deliverance. It is savior. That's what Hosanna actually does mean. Sometimes we think it's oh, you know we're gonna Hosanna, you know that kind of thing, right? Hosanna. When you are, are drowning in a pool of water, you're not saying, hey, rescue me, rescue me. You're shouting to the top of your lungs, and that's why they say, shout Hosanna, right? So that's, that's the part of that. So you're going to have a chance to do that in the next few minutes with songs, so I encourage you to do that. I don't need to tell you about some things that are coming up. We're right on the Easter Eve and if you know anything about the DNA here at the uh, church at 434, it's all about what has been the Easter egg hunt, the community Easter egg. We have a egg experience this year that we want to share with you. You can participate. Many of you have been practicing on the, in the weeks that have led up to this. If you have the purple shirt, fantastic. If you don't, We'll get you one. If you have one, you're not going to show up. We need it. So we, all those things put together is going to culminate on Saturday at 8.30 a.m. over in the um, gazebo parking lot uh, next in uh, Longwood Historic District. You need to park at the church next door and then come over and get instructions. How many of you have been doing this so you don't get tennis elbow the next day? You've been practicing this? That's all you need to do. That's the skill level that you need to have. So all of you should qualify for that. So I encourage you to be a part of that. Men fill, filling station tonight. Kids are excited about the big inning. And a lot of you have picked up your scripts. That starts on April the 7th. We have a family week break this week, only for one week. So don't show up here on Wednesday night. No one will be here to greet you. All right? And then finally, kids, today... Family Fun Day, right after the service. Pick up your own food, and then we're going to run around and have a great time together. How many of you are ready for a great day of worship? Let's stand up. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a test. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that is ours on this Palm Sunday. Father, that we would give you our best form of worship this morning. We are so grateful for what you did on a cross, that we would be redeemed. Father, may we live it out even today in this moment, for it's in your name that we pray. Amen. to the well that never runs dry drink of the water come and thirst no more come all ye sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for
blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Praise God, praise God from whom all blessings flow. together father once more we thank you for jesus and for the price that we stopped for a couple of weeks to recognize you paid lord we thank you for this palm sunday that reminds us that uh, it's easy when things are easy to worship you it's easy when the crowd is screaming alongside to worship you but we know as the day progresses as the week progresses that will change or historically that changed and lord for us we are in a time where it's also changing in some places for us lord i pray that you help us to be strong uh, to be focused and to remember all it is that you have done so that we might have life that lasts forever with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hosanna. Hosanna. Richard, you even missed it. Dude, one more time. Hosanna. Would you be seated? Yeah, the fir that first time was a little bit weak. Um, just, 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 just saying. Wow, you do sound good this morning. Take your Bibles and turn to the New Testament. John chapter 19 is where we're going to be this morning, as we begin a new series, counting our way down to Easter. This is Palm Sunday, and we are rocketing toward Easter next weekend. And we begin a series called Cancel Culture. Today, specifically, we're going to talk about culture canceling Jesus. Culture canceling Jesus. And we invite you to keep your Bibles open. We're going to move into what is a familiar story. Uh, we are definitely counting our way down toward Easter. We're going to talk about what Jesus did, why he did it. But also, I think, give you some helpful uh, resources, uh, some information uh, that might help you as you navigate uh, this world that we live in just a little bit better. Uh, because trust me when I tell you this, it's out there lurking, believe it or not, lying in wait for you. It's taken on celebrities like J.K. Rowling, uh, Ellen DeGeneres, Roseanne Barr, Chris Pratt. Nearly all of America's founding fathers um, have been victimized by it. No matter which side of the Civil War you were on, Confederate leaders to Abraham Lincoln to General and later President Ulysses S. Grant, even Frederick Douglass has been attempted to be canceled by the culture that we live in. If you're an NCAA basketball fan, Oral Roberts University this past weekend had to face the cancel culture when the USA Today said that a Christian university had no right or did not deserve to be in the NCAA playoffs based upon their beliefs and their standings. And so they were eliminated yesterday by Arkansas, who canceled them for real, but neither here nor there. <laughs> in academic circles, uh, people have fared no better. Uh, there have been many people, events, and ideas that have been targeted by the cancel cultures uh, of the day. I suppose if you're trying to put a running tally on it, it would click over quicker than the U.S. debt clock, but it is real and it goes on in our world all the time. If the idea behind it, the mindset behind it, is if you don't like something, just get rid of it. If you don't think that it makes you feel good, then it must be eliminated. If you think it's evil, tell it goodbye, or in other words, cancel it. Now, believe it or not, cancel culture has an official definition. It's this, the practice or tendency of engaging in mass canceling as a way of expressing disapproval and exerting social pressure. But let me put it in practical terms. Let's face it. If Dr. Seuss, George Washington, Dumbo, and other Disney classics can get canceled, you and I could get canceled as well. Or at least that's what culture might try to do to you. But as a follower, if you know Jesus, I would suggest that you can think of it this way. It's nonsense and you don't have to play along. Because on the surface, it really is just uh, weak and intellectually vacant people trying to flex muscles in a society that they only wish they had. Because cancel culture, if you go back and take a look at it, doesn't really work. Here's what I mean. Celebrities that get canceled, eh, they still make money. When Dr. Seuss was canceled a couple weeks ago, you realize over the last two weeks he sold more books over the last two weeks than he's sold for the last five years than any two-week period in history. I'm still watching Disney films. I don't know about you. Um, but at the end of the day, canceled culture still makes news, but it's puzzling because it doesn't really seem to work. But for you as a follower, how do you deal with canceled culture? How do you approach cancel culture? How do you live in a cancel culture wor world? And I would suggest to you that perhaps the best way to deal with it is by using the words of Jesus himself to help you navigate it. He was the one who said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. So in other words, as followers, here's the deal. We don't participate. We don't have to be the kind of people that cancel each other. As a matter of fact, in a cancel culture where people are worried and nervous about what's going to happen to them next, we are folks who are supposed to carry hope, and we're supposed to carry his light into the world around us. And if we do it right and we do it well, we help restore value and help people discover meaning and passion for their lives. In a world where people are frightened that they might do something wrong or say something wrong or, or or even without trying to do something wrong that might get them canceled. 
we as followers understand better than others that we don't have to fear it and nor do we need to participate in it. And so this morning, I want to set the tone for what we're going to talk about in the next couple of weeks as we move toward Easter and take you back into the story of Jesus uh, during that last week, particularly on that Friday when he was crucified. And I want you to understand something about cancel culture. It's not new. And here's what I mean. The first thing I want you to discover is I want you to meet the cancel culture. Meet the cancel culture. In John 19, verses 1 through 7, we read these words. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they slapped him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for any charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. And as soon as the chief priests and officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! crucify. But Pilate answered, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis of charge against him. And the Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to the law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. If you want to try to understand cancel culture, you have to know this about it. It's not new. As a matter of fact, it happened thousands of years ago. Think of the Pharisees. They were the original cancel culturers. They were the ones that tried to cancel Jesus. And so this is not new. It's not something that's just happened. This is something that's happened now that we put a name on. But if I were to ask you this morning, if you know anything about the Bible, who in the room wants to be known as a Pharisee? Let me see those hands. Let me see them. Let them go way up there. Most of you aren't racing to get your hands up. Most of you don't want even to halfway raise your hand. You don't want anyone to look at you and think that you're a Pharisee. But yet, that's exactly who these guys were. They were a small fringe of society, a small group that had become the moral arbiters of right and wrong. Today in our culture, there's no open voting on it. If someone decides to cancel you, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. You can't take it to a judge and a jury and have your case heard somewhere. Um, the canceling process begins, and once the decision is handed down, for the most part, people feel like it's final. And at that moment, from that moment on, you have to deal with whatever it means to be ousted from whatever group you wanted to be a part of, pushed to the edges of society, or not considered uh, to be worthy of even being recognized. But remembering that this is not new and that Jesus faced the same thing, here's what you have to know as a follower. Not only as followers do we not need to participate in cancel culture, but let me give you a now what. Now what is how you apply what you're learning, what you do with what you're hearing, and it's simply this. Don't be a canceler. In other words, don't do it. There are way too many people out there who are ready to jump at any chance to tell someone what they ought to be doing, tell someone that they don't like something about them, and do their best to marginalize them so no one will pay attention to them. We live in a world where people desperately need attention. We live in a world where desperately people want to know that they are loved and that they're valuable. We live in a world where people need to be affirmed. And in a world that is rapidly changing and in a culture that seems to be shifting very quickly, you and I are those folks that have the opportunity, not because we're good, but because God is great, to be able to step into their worlds and offer to them a word of hope and encouragement that they can't find anywhere else. Don't be a canceler. It's not new. It's been going on a long time. You've met them in the Scripture. They're the Pharisees. Don't be that Pharisee. The second thing that I want you to see, though, also is there is a manufacturing that takes place within the cancel culture. Look at verses 7 through 12. The Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. And when Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. He went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. In verse 10, Pilate says, do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you realize that I have the power to free you or to crucify you? And Jesus answered, you have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. And from then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, if you let this man go, 
you're no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. So Pilate knuckles under to this cancel culture pressure uh, that these Jewish leaders were putting on him. And if you're not used to reading the story, it's easy to do a quick read of this and think, man, Pilate was trying to do the right thing. He was trying to let Jesus go. If you don't know the story or the background very well, you might walk away with the misconception that Pilate was a good guy. He was not. He was a political opportunist. He was a mercenary. He was evil. He stood against all the things of God, but he also was trying to protect himself. And he found himself in the very difficult position of trying to balance out what the mob wanted that day and how to navigate his role in the Roman government. The Jews felt threatened. They didn't like what Jesus said. They didn't like what he said about them. They felt like they had been turned against. They felt like they had been victimized by Jesus. And because they were victims, they then felt entitled to cancel Jesus. They believed it gave them the right to eliminate them. And one of the difficulties with cancel culture is simply this. In a culture where there really are victims that are out there that need to be cared for, cancel culture makes victimhood a virtue. And when you elevate victimhood to a virtue, you have people stumbling over themselves trying to be oppressed so they can say they're oppressed so they can mount the case to cancel someone else. And what it does is it hurts those who really do need to be cared for. It causes us as a society to miss those that we really need to reach into the world and try to help them. It causes us as people not to be able to assist those that really need assistance. And instead it creates a world where it's fashionable to be a victim, to cry foul, and then call for someone else to be canceled. And that kind of culture sets up the backdrop where anyone can easily be offended. Everyone feels like there's something that they're entitled to whine about. And instead of dealing with issues head on, and instead of trying to solve problems creatively, honestly, with an openness and loving heart, instead, we just want to eliminate or ignore or cancel whatever it is that we feel victimized by. At the end of the day, what you have to understand is that truth has no value in cancel culture. The, the downside of a cancel culture, the, 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 the cancel culture left unchecked puts truth into an arena where there is no longer value. Right and wrong has nothing to do with it. It's about how well you sell your story, who hears your story, and how quickly you can push it out. And by manufacturing it, you can cancel anyone at any time in any way that you choose to. See, you have to work hard sometimes to be offended. You have to work hard sometimes to deflect truth. Has anyone ever looked at you and said, I hope I didn't offend you? I'll be real honest with you. I rarely get offended. Because I don't tend to give anybody that arena in my life to offend me. But we live in a world where we are hypersensitive to the fact that we don't want to be offensive. And I want you to know something. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus and deal with truth, the truth is a little bit offensive. You want to hear the offensive truth? You are a sinner. You are broken and you are recklessly, hopelessly wrecked. And without the grace, compassion, and salvation of Jesus Christ, you are lost and you will miss eternity with him in heaven. See, to even step into the arena to be a follower of Christ, you have to step up and say, begin with the groundwork, I, you know, I'm a sinner and I couldn't make it on my own. But because I am and I see that you've done what you've done, there's hope for me. Well, I got news for you. You want to see if it's offensive or not? Walk, to some, walk up to somebody that you don't know in the Walmart, a complete stranger, and say, hey, you know what? You are a wicked, cursed, broken sinner. And point at them for good, good measure. <laughs> and to show them your intense shake a little bit. It's not the best way to win friends and influence enemies, but it is one of those things where when you do it and when you say it, you recognize that there is something that has to happen within each one of us if we're going to be 
and become the best version of ourselves. And that entry point is Jesus and what he's done. You may have heard the news in Texas this week. There was a woman who was offended by the truth in the Bible. And so she decided that she was going to have a book burning in her backyard. So she gathered all the Bibles that she could. And here's how the story uh, in the Daily News reported it. A massive blaze engulfed two Texas homes on Sunday. And they began with a woman setting her Bibles on fire, according to her neighbors. A San Antonio resident was burning the sacred book in her backyard when the fire suddenly spread into her house and her neighbor's house, according to witnesses of the station WOIA-TV. No one was injured in the early morning blaze, but the fire caused about $150,000 in damages. And multiple residents were displaced along with their dogs, according to the station. After the fire was finally subdued, the unnamed suspect was cuffed and taken into custody, although at this point no formal charges had been filed. When asked why they did it, the answer, simple. The Bible offended the resident. They didn't like the things that it said, so it was okay to destroy it. So what do you do with that? Well, based on what I just said, it makes it very, very clear that one of the things that you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're someone who loves Jesus and wants to make an impact in the world, here's another now what, an application. What do you do with what you hear? And it's simply this. Hold on to the truth and be good with the truth. Be good with the truth. Because we know that the truth will set you free. But not knowing the truth keeps you locked in bondage and keeps you always trapped and always struggling to find your place and find your way. And in a world that has decided that truth is a relative thing, truth isn't a relative, truth is in a person, Jesus. And his truth, you can anchor to, to weather the storms of the culture, no matter what happens, no matter how it swings, and no matter where it might take you. Because to create hatred, You have to manufacture that. And we live in a world that doesn't hesitate to manufacture all the reasons that things aren't right and all the reason that things aren't going well for us and all the reasons that things can't be the way we want them to be. And for the most part, nobody wants to take responsibility or ownership for the problems that they create. And so it can't be wrong that I'm offended. It must be wrong that you did what you did. I'll cancel you. Hold on to the truth. And when you get good with the truth, you begin to discover that the things of God are true. And what Jesus said, he loves us. He's the one we find value and worth in. He's where we find our meaning and purpose. And he reminds us that if you are without sin, then go ahead, throw the stone. Ah, but if you recognize who you are, then why would you ever try to cancel someone else? Instead, you simply want to make sure that they have the opportunity to see in your light the love of Jesus in a way uh, that would nudge him closer to the kingdom and give you the opportunity to share with him who he is and what he's done. See, as we move into this season uh, of the year, it's important as we come uh, through Palm Sunday to recognize that, yes, Easter is coming, and Easter is just around the corner, but part of that Easter celebration involves Jesus going through what he went through so that we could celebrate that empty tomb that we get to next Sunday. And so the last thing I want you to see is maddening to the cancel culture. Absolutely maddening to the cancel culture. Verses 28 through 30, it says this, Later, knowing that everything had now been finished, Jesus is now on the cross at this point in the story. And so the scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus said, I am thirsty. And a jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. And as Jesus is being crucified, in spite of the best efforts of the cancel culture, they could not cancel Jesus. They fail. They just don't know it yet. Because in spite of their best efforts, what happened on the cross was a miracle. In the miracle of atonement, water didn't become wine, but sinners got the opportunity to become saints. 
On Calvary, Jesus didn't heal a servant with a proclamation, but he healed all generations with an affirmation. On the cross, Jesus didn't tell a lame man to walk. He invited us all to a dance. And in a single phrase, Jesus accomplished more than feeding a crowd, more than stilling a storm. He accomplished more than giving sight to more than one person. On what he said next on Calvary changes everything. If you keep reading the passage of verse 30, it says this. When he received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. The words that some of your translations might say is tetelestai, which is a word that is a banking term, which means the transaction is now done. When Jesus says it's finished, it's a moment when you come to it in Scripture that you remove your hat, take off your shoe, shoes, silence the chatter for just a moment, and recognize that you are now on holy ground. Is that moment when the artist steps back from the canvas and lowers his brush for the last time as he looks at the painting and says, it is finished. Is that moment when the writer quits writing, rereads the paragraph for the last time, puts his pen down and steps back from the desk and says, it's done. It is finished. It is that moment when the farmer stops to gaze out on the field that he's harvested, look out across and see that everything is done, takes the hat off, wipes his brow and looks out with a sigh and says, it is finished. And in this moment, as Jesus has gone through all that he's gone through, through his swollen eyes, he looks toward heaven, and his burning lungs give him enough air to announce, it is finished. And then keep reading the verse. Because in verse 30 it says, and bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Don't run past the verse or let it be so familiar that you miss what's being said there. He did not slump. He did not fall forward. He did not swoon. He bowed his head. The man on the center cross was now on the center stage of history. You notice we put the set up as we get ready for Easter. We have this massive cross. It matches the logo for the series, by the way. Uh, in the middle with the crosses on the side. But the crosses are turned to look like X's because we live in a world that would cancel everyone out. But it's only in the middle that we find the opportunity to know that you don't have to live a canceled life. And no matter how hard the culture tried to cancel Jesus, no matter what they had done, this was their best effort. This was their last gasp. But they only discovered that Jesus, even in his death, did not work on their terms. He did not play their games. And he didn't give in to the rules. And it maddened them because Jesus would not be canceled. Because even as we just read, when he died, he was in charge. He was the one that made the call. It's enough. It's finished. He was the one that bowed his head. And he was the one that made the choice to give up his spirit when he was done. Not before. Not later. When he was done. John 10, 18 says it this way. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, the authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. Jesus, when he stretched out his arms, he did what needed to be done so that you and I could have a life that is worth living. He did what needed to be done so you and I could have a life worth uh, talking about and sharing. He did what needed to be done. Because in that moment, he was willing to catch everything that we could throw at him. Every sin, every misstep, every mistake, every rotten word, every bad thought, everything that you wish you would have done but you didn't do, everything that you thought you should have done but you didn't do, all of those moments where you thought, you know, I should have just done that better and I really screwed that up. He caught all of those and when he had finished catching all of them, not before, but when he had caught everything that he needed to catch for you and me. He looked toward heaven and said, it's finished. And then he bowed his head and he was done. And as much as we want to race to the empty tomb, and I do too, and as much as we will celebrate this week with bunnies and eggs and egg hunts and fun and parties and that's all cool, but you can't get to there without going by the cross. And you can't get to there without remembering what he did. 
And sometimes we skip past it so quickly uh, that we forget that we so often share with you that while Christmas gives us hope, it is Easter that makes us heroes because we can live a heroic life because of what he did on the cross for us. And he paid the price for death, and he paid the price for my sin, he paid the price for your sin, and he was willing to catch everything that I could throw at him. And he covered it all and left nothing undone. Not one little sin have you ever committed that snuck its way through. Not one little transgression in your life that's kind of eeks by that Jesus missed. He caught them all so that you could have life. The girl's name is Kayla Montgomery. Kayla was a runner. She was a steady and sturdy runner, and she was determined. She was one of the fastest long-distance runners in the country. Trained observers took note of Kayla, her stride and strong finish. Her performance on her high school team in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, caught the attention of competitors, coaches, and colleges. She would set distance records. She won state titles. She competed nationally in AAU events. And she eventually landed a scholarship to Lipscomb University in Nashville, Tennessee. If you would have seen her run, you would have been impressed. But here is what you never would have imagined when you watched Kayla run. She had no feeling in her legs. She was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis when she was 15 years old. It's an autoimmune disease uh, that attacks the sheath of nerves that affects the brain and the spine. Heat sensitivity is one of the many possible symptoms of MS. And so when Kayla overheats, her MS symptoms begin to flare up and she loses the feeling in her legs and it leaves her numb from the waist down. Still, she wanted to run. She wanted to compete. She went to her high school track coach and said these words to him as a ninth grader. I want to run, and I want to run fast. Knowing her, knowing her condition, his expectations were fairly low. His original expectations is were by the time that she got to her senior year, she might, might be able to make the varsity team. At best, if she could make the varsity team, perhaps she could let her, it would be a great moment to remember her high school experience, and she could move on with life but she said she wanted to run, and she wanted to run fast. And Kayla ran fast. As a matter of fact, by the time she was a senior in high school, she was one of the top 25 in the country. And the numbness would begin to set in at mile marker number one as her body started heating up. And just like clockwork, she would begin to lose feeling in her body, and it would crawl down her legs until she could no longer feel her legs running as she continued the race. After that, she would rely on momentum, autopilot, that would keep her moving forward. And by doing so, the running was doable. The problem was stopping. Because with the momentum she would build up, stopping was another story. Because in each race, when she crossed the finish line, she had lost the ability to decelerate. Because she was running on autopilot, she was going to run and run and run. And so the only way she could possibly stop was for someone to stop her. Enter her coach, Patrick Cromwell. He was a fixture at his races, shouting, encouraging, prodding, calling out times. But his greatest contribution to Kayla was catching her. He caught Kayla. He would stand at the finish line waiting for her. And she ran right into his arms. She didn't slow down, ever. And he did not move. It was no small collision. 
When he was finally able to halt her progress, he would lift her five foot one frame off the ground in a heap and carry her off the track. And over and over again, if you were close, you would hear her saying, I can't feel my legs. Please help me. I can't feel my legs. And he would carry her off the track and over and over on the, on the way to the center of the infield, he would say to her, it's okay, Kayla, I've got you. I've got you. I've got you. And he would carry her over to a spot and give her water and ice, and gradually her body temperature would lower, and the feeling in her legs would return. How is that even possible? Why don't we let you watch her run? Take a look. And he catches her every time. I told you that Kayla was very successful as she ran. I also said that she won state championships. And as amazing as her story is, to really appreciate the value of winning that state championship, you need to see what happens in it. Now at 9 o'clock, because of the time and because we have a harder deadline to finish up, we didn't get a chance to show this. So we have some 9 o'clock folks that have tuned back in at 11.15 to watch the live feed because they wanted to see it because we told them there was another clip coming. This is that clip from our high school state championship. They had an agreement. She did the running. He did the catching. He wasn't there to catch her. She'd had to keep going until she hit some big obstacle, something that would knock her down. But she never crashed, ever, because he was always present, and he was always there to catch her. That was the coach's promise to a young girl who said she wanted to run and wanted to run fast. I will always catch you. That's the promise that God makes to us. He says to us, I will always, always catch you. But as I watch, as I think about it, as much as it's a story about running, it's really a story about who catches you at the end of the race. And that's what happened on that Good Friday that didn't look so good. It was Jesus making the promise to bring everything that you had and when it was all said and done, he would be willing to catch you. And he stretched out his arms so that you could be where he is. See, you don't have a whole lot of choice. You're going to get up tomorrow, and you're going to run through the day, and you're going to do what you need to do. You're going to take care of business. You're going to do it the next day, and you're going to do it the next day. And you will run, and you can run, and you can get tired. But at the end of the day, who's going to be there to catch you? And that's what the cross reminds us. That Jesus not only will catch you, but when you get there, he will wrap his arms around you. And if you listen closely, you'll hear him say, it is finished. And only when it's finished does real life begin. He was willing to catch everything that we could throw at him. And he took it all because he refused to be canceled and he refused to let you be canceled and by doing that he gives you the opportunity to have life and so as we move toward this next weekend as we think about the resurrection that we will celebrate next Sunday also remember the sacrifice that he made so that you could have life today in the here and now 
and know that you don't have to live canceled. Would you bow your heads and hearts and let's pray together. God, we think about what you have done for us, especially during this time of year, this particular week of the year. And we are mindful of the fact that had you not been willing to do what you did for us, that we never would have had a life worth living. Because God, to be honest with you, there are some days that we feel like we're doing everything that we can. We're moving as fast as we can. We're pushing as hard as we can. And, and we don't know how to stop. And yet we are reminded that you stretched out your hands and you caught everything in our world so that we could have a life, as you described it, an abundant life of living for you that gives us purpose and passion and meaning. Or there are some who will be either in this room this morning who are watching us live now who will watch us uh, over the course of the week. They've never made the decision. They've never made the choice to believe, trust, and follow Jesus. They've never made the choice to run into your arms and allow you to take all the bad and not only forgive it, but then give back to us a life that gives us victory as we move to the future. And so, Lord, for anyone who's never, made, who's never made that decision, I pray that before they would leave this place this morning, they would take a worship flyer, simply check that spot that says, I want to ask Jesus into my heart and I want to accept him as Savior. Put it in the giving kiosk on the way out the door. And give us an opportunity to contact them. Let them know this decision you're making, what it means, and, and how it happens, and what happens next. Lord, if they're watching us online, either live or watching us later, I pray that even now they would just stop, stop the feed, they would send us an email and say, that's the choice I want to make. So that even this day we can get back with them and share with them, okay, you've made this decision, you want to make this decision, this is what happens now. And try to give them the resources that they need to be able uh, to discover a life that can only be found in you. But Lord, we also know that there are a lot of us in this room who have already made the decision to believe, trust, and follow you. And we're navigating a culture that would love to cancel the things of God, that would uh, love to set us at arm's length, that would love at times just to not deal with the truth of who we are and what you called us to be. To be honest with you, God, sometimes that scares us and it bothers us more than we want to admit. But Lord, I pray that you would remind us that cancel culture is not anything new. It's been going on for thousands of years. And yet in you, we discover how we not only navigate it, but how we take it and defeat it and move away from it even stronger. And as Lord, begin that process in our lives even today as we move toward Easter Sunday and in the weeks ahead so that we might have that life that you created us to live. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It is good to celebrate with you this morning and we thank you for being here. Uh, I'm going to ask you to stand up so I, we can dismiss us. But um, remember, this coming week is a busy week. Um, this coming Saturday in Ryder Park, the experience will take place. It is a walkthrough event this year. Um, your job is to help motion people through it. You can wiggle a little bit when you do it. That sometimes helps. You're going to be moving crowds through it. They'll be looking on a, it'll be like a scavenger hunt for eggs. Um, it will be fun. We're excited to be back in the downtown area again. That happens on Saturday morning. Um, if you haven't signed up yet, please do so. Uh, and let us know you're going to be there. If you have a purple shirt, we need it, um, and that would be helpful for us as well. Also, 
um, this afternoon. Families, if you're here and you have kids, go grab yourself some lunch, get back. We're going to play together outside, have a good time. Uh, Family Fun Day. See, last week we canceled because it was wet, rainy, and cold. This week, we left it on the counter, and it's hot, and you're going to melt. But we're going to do it in the name of Jesus. It'll be fun, all right? Close your eyes one time as we dismiss, uh, as we pray and we leave today. Have a great week. God, we thank you that you are a God who does everything that you promised and more. In you we find victory, and you we find hope. Be with us in this week ahead. In Jesus' name, amen.